Um, my, my name is Jim Mowad. I'm a field application engineer with Intel, uh, specifically in Intel's programmable solution group, which is the FPGA division. Um, and uh, who the programmable solutions group is, is a group within Intel that came in by way of acquisition of Altera. Um, Pete Beckman mentioned that earlier. Uh, that happened in 2015. And so now we're a, a few years in. And uh, the Programmable Solutions Group is responsible for uh, these four blue squares, which are device families of FPGAs. Um, and also there's a fifth device family, which is called Imperion, which is a, um, a set of power SOCs that can be used to help power up these FPGAs or other things. Um, and then in addition, at the bottom of this slide, the Programmable Solutions Group also creates a bunch of resources to be able to program for these FPGAs. And um, the biggest piece in that is the Cordis Prime design software. So that's a full, big design software package. And um, there are also development kits and pieces of IP, and there are even uh, processors that can be put into the FPGAs, uh, including a proprietary uh, processor architecture that's been around for two decades now called NEOS 2. And um, we do have devices that have uh, hardened ARM Cortex-A class processors in them. Uh, but really today, our focus is going to be on this one piece here, which is the Intel FPGA SDK for OpenCL. And in a minute, I'll explain why we're focusing on that today. Um, so first, we'll start with just a level set here. What is an FPGA? I guess uh, I'm curious, a show of hands. How many people here are familiar with FPGA? You know, what, what's in them, what it takes to compile for them? Yeah, okay, no, I sort of expected that, just a few hands. Um, and that's uh, a good reason for why we're having this talk today, is to talk about um, how people who aren't that familiar with FPGA could target an FPGA. Okay. So what exactly is an FPGA? We'll level set here with just a like uh, three minute tutorial on what an FPGA is, and then we'll get into what to do with it. From Intel, there are four device families um, that are uh, being shipped in volume today. Uh, the Max lineup, which are our smallest, uh, simplest devices. Uh, Cyclone is a line of FPJs, which are also very low power, very low cost. Um, and then we have Aria, which is a nice workhorse. And Stratix is the flagship lineup. And so all these devices are highly configurable. The F and the P in FPGA stand for field programmable. So we can program these things in the field. We can reprogram them in the field. Um, and that is one of the big value propositions. Any application where you can take advantage of the fact that I can change my circuit that's out there in the field uh, is good for an FPGA. Um, so traditionally, we've had a lot of applications in data communication, networking, things like that, where the standards are constantly evolving. And um, you know, our customers want to be able to push out and update to the way their hardware works. They can do that with a field programmable gate array. Um, similarly, these FPGAs, you can build up a hardware circuit inside them. They're very configurable and customizable. So I can build custom hardware that can do exactly the kind of compute I want. And uh, as a result, these have been used very heavily in some compute intensive places like uh, medical imaging, uh, radar processing, uh, places where you have a lot of intensive DSP. So over the years, uh, pretty much every FPGA vendor out there has loaded these FPGAs with not only an array of logic, but an array full of uh, hardened DSP blocks, a multiply and accumulator block. And there's a bunch of these distributed throughout the FPGA. And then all those compute resources typically need places to store bits of memory as they're processing on them. So we have block RAMs distributed throughout the chip. And then there's programmable interconnect that connects the thing all up. And then in addition to these things I threw on the slide, there are a bunch of other pieces. These things have become full system on chips these days uh, that might be hardened as well. Things like PCI Express, uh, or I mentioned a, you know, perhaps some variants have an, you know, something like an ARM hard processor system on there. You might have a full blown, you know, uh, 1.5 gigahertz Cortex A9 quad core included in the chip. Um, you know, other functions might be hardened as well, like your DDR memory controller, 
or we have devices now that have embedded high bandwidth memory. Uh, so all those other things might fit in there, but those are on the periphery of the FPJ to help you build up a full system. But the core of the FPJ is basically these three building blocks, logic, DSP units, and block RAMs. So we can build up really uh, a big, wide variety, just about any kind of circuit with those three pieces. Okay. And so uh, from Intel, I mentioned a few different families there earlier, some different series we have. So uh, I'm not going to go through all the details in this slide here. You have the slide deck for your reference, so you can look at this later. But my main point here was to show you the devices that are shipping today and being actively designed in start anywhere from a really small 40 logic element, that's kind of our basic building block um, device, so all the way from 40 logic elements up to more than 5 million. So there's a huge range. And the fact that we have very big devices, you know, a million logic elements, 5 million logic elements available today, uh, means these can be used for very high performance compute kind of applications. So the next piece of the puzzle is I've got this device. It's got stuff inside it so I can build circuits. How do I program for it? So the traditional FPGA designer flow, this is how people have been programming for FPGAs for a couple decades now, is I code up the logic for a circuit in a couple hardware description languages or register transfer level languages. Uh, we call this RTL coding. And there's two main languages used in the industry today, um, VHDL and Verilog. Uh, they're very similar. Uh, you'll, you know, like any other language war, you'll get people that are very much in one camp and think the other camp uh, you know, shouldn't be there and vice versa. Uh, but th those are the two languages that dominate the industry. They are used not only for FPJs, they are also used for ASIC design, so same languages. So I would have to come up with uh, my design spec and write a bunch of RTL code either Verilog or VHDL, or I can mix the two, no problem. But I have to write a bunch of code um, or get it from somewhere. Uh, today's chips are huge, so it's very common to go uh, write your specialized function, but then also grab another block from a vendor that has a already completed circuit that does something you want, et cetera, and build a whole chip full of stuff you want to do. And then um, once I have all the code that I want, I will typically simulate. There's pretty much a de facto standard tool for simulating. Um, it's a tool called ModelSim for Mentor Graphics. So I'll use ModelSim for Mentor Graphics to simulate, double check that the behavior and functionality of the circuit is doing what I think it does. And uh, then I need to uh, do something called synthesis, which is taking my code and actually turning it into the basic building blocks that I do have in a chip. So uh, the synthesis uh, can be using a tool from the FPGA vendor. So every FPGA vendor has their own synthesis tool, um, or most FPGA vendors, I should say, have their own synthesis tool. Um, there are also third-party synthesis tools, and so an FPGA vendor can uh, send you off to a third-party synthesis tool, or if you wish, you can use a third-party synthesis tool. But that synthesis function will take your logic and turn it into low-level primitives and uh, give you something called a net list that you can then feed into a tool for place and route, or in the case of Intel, we refer to it as a fit, because uh, the place and route are handled interactively. Um, but in any case, you'll feed it into that tool, and then the output of that, you will then need to do some timing analysis on it, which means you need to know how to write timing constraints in a language called uh, SDC, which is Synopsis Design Constraints, and you'll want to double check that it all works, and then at the end of the day, then you can program your device and check it all out. And um, this is uh, quite a bit of specialized steps that FPGA engineers um, have gained a skill set in doing these things. But the big dilemma we have is that people outside of you know, FPGA designers, typically all this is quite foreign to them. So we're not going to go through any of this today. Uh, what we are going to go through is how to do something totally different to program the FPGA. So uh, we're going to look at how to use the OpenCL language to uh, handle a lot of those tasks for us and automate some of that. Um, so we'll start by talking about um, 
parallel programming in general. Uh, just a brief touch on that. And then also, similarly, we'll go through very briefly uh, data sharing and synchronization. And then we'll talk about the OpenCL language. Um, the, the slides we go through here try to address what OpenCL is from a generic standpoint, because OpenCL is an open language. It's not specific to FPGAs. It can be used for um, a variety of other hardware architectures, too. And then we'll talk about um, the two pieces of writing in OpenCL, uh, which is the host side, and then what we call the kernel side. And then we'll get into compiling circuits, and then specifically a few things specific to the Intel FPGA SDK for OpenCL. All right, so we'll start with just a few comments on parallel computing. Um, you've seen many of the hardware architectures earlier today that were presented, uh, they're all uh, pretty much everything I saw was a heterogeneous computing environment where we have different kinds of compute elements in a system. Uh, whether it's combining a GPU with CPUs and other uh, functions, uh, but in general we have a heterogeneous compute system. So we have more than one kind of processor. And applications have uh, different behaviors and some functions like control functions might perform well on a superscalar CPU. Um, other data intensive functions perform well on like a vector processing unit. And we also have compute intensive tasks that maybe we might wanna do. Those compute intensive tasks really will run best if you have specialized hardware. So a lot of times we may have a custom ASIC that does some compute function. Or in the case of an FPGA, we can build up uh, the custom function to do those tasks as well. And if we have a heterogeneous parallel computer environment, we can really gain a lot of performance by being able to send the different uh, tasks that need to be handled to the different pieces of hardware that exist in our system. So the traditional approach, approach to heterogeneous computing is to write software for each of those different kinds of architectures. And usually this, um, this may mean different tools, uh, maybe even different languages. Uh, vendor-specific tools that you're working with. And um, in the case of FPGA, we may want to develop some custom parallel hardware. I showed you the flow that's often used for that earlier. That's a lot of work that's quite different from some of the other software development work that might need to happen in a system. Um, so uh, this is all a challenge, and OpenCL attempts to uh, help uh, you know, make a lot of this much easier. So in terms of a, uh, a software programmer, if a software programmer is very familiar with his algorithm, typically the software programmer will also know what pieces in there uh, can be parallelized. And um, the software programmer will be able to take advantage of that and express it either explicitly or implicitly. Um, and you can take advantage of different levels uh, that are higher than instruction level parallelism. And as a programmer, if you can define what is going to be parallelized, that is often a lot more effective than just letting the compiler try to identify and, and, and um, come up with those tasks. And in OpenCL, you'll see that we explicitly define where the parallelism exists. So three main types of parallelism. Um, really, there's, most people think of two categories where we have data parallelism, where you have the same operation that needs to happen on a large chunk of data. And then um, we also have task parallelism. So task parallelism will, uh, we see it very commonly in an OS uh, running on a multi-threaded CPU where the tasks are sent off to different units to, to be operated on. So you compose a problem and break it down into different sub-problems and each of the problem runs in a different piece of hardware. Pipeline parallelism is a more specific type of data parallelism where we can uh, feed the results of one operation directly into the next operation. So we, have, we break apart our different uh, pieces of, of a function that needs to operate on data into separate units, and each unit then feeds into the next. And so we can take advantage of uh, not only data parallelism, but we can pipeline that as well. So 
Here's a basic picture of data parallelism. This is kind of a scatter gather approach where you take uh, multiple data and send it off to a bunch of different compute units. So in this case, we're, if we're multiplying one vector with another vector, we split all the elements apart and send them to the correct units and operate on that. And if we have n multiples of in our uh, n units in our vector, it would be ideal if we also had n units of multiplication available. That'd be great. That'd be the best case scenario. Uh, but if not, we would work with whatever number of units we had out there. Uh, and then in terms of task parallelism, I think this is a little bit more straightforward because we're all familiar with multi-threaded CPUs where we'll distribute our tasks across to different compute elements that are out there. And then in terms of pipeline parallelism, so this is uh, what I was describing a minute ago where we can take our data parallelism and pipeline it as well so that we can have different units operating on the results of the previous unit so that you don't have a one big chunk of compute that has to complete before you start processing the next piece of data. As long as there's no data dependency, we can do this. So this is quite common where uh, you, know, you might have, uh, in this example here, we're performing an FFT, then we have a transfer function uh, filter, and then we perform an inverse FFT, and so the data will flow through the different blocks in sequence, and that's our pipeline. Okay, so this we call pipeline parallelism. Right. So uh, with that, we'll move on to the next topic here that we want to get a baseline on, which is data sharing and synchronization. So in terms of data sharing, uh, Managing memory and you know, how you're going to share data is really one of the fundamental challenges of any kind of parallel programming. And uh, tasks that don't share data, there's no problem there because then we don't need to worry about synchronization. Uh, if there are data dependencies, now we need to work about synchronization and manage how the tasks are going to you know, know when, whether they can operate with the data or not. And there's different mechanisms for that, barriers, or locks or mutual exclusions or um, something along those lines, but the parallel computing environment needs a way to handle this. When data is needed across multiple tasks, the simplest way to do this would be to just set up a shared memory model where all the tasks have one view of memory, and the, you know, from an implementation standpoint, that's great because it's easy, um, but there are drawbacks in that you will end up with bottlenecks. It doesn't uh, necessarily scale very well. The more different tasks you have or more compute elements you have, as those really increase in number, you're going to end up with contention for the same memory. And so um, a better method might be to, do, to use message passing. So the message passing model will be where we have tasks and uh, they each have their own view of memory and the memory uh, contents are passed from one task to another via message passing. And this is a much better approach um, for a system that really needs to scale up so that we don't end up with memory bottlenecks uh, because so many tasks are, are going at the same memory together. Okay. So given that baseline of some things about parallel computing, we'll talk a little bit about OpenCL. Uh, I'm curious, how many people here have um, used OpenCL in the past? Yeah, okay, a few hands. Uh, I'm wondering what you were targeting when you used OpenCL, what kind of uh, compute? Yeah. GPU. GPU. Yeah, so that, uh, that's common that I find people that if they've worked with OpenCL, it's usually to target a GPU. Um, probably an AMD GPU, uh, maybe an NVIDIA GPU. Um, but the same language can be used to target FPGAs, and that's what we're going to go through a little bit today. But before we get there, for everyone else in the room that hasn't used OpenCL, we'll talk a little bit about OpenCL, and then we'll get into the FPGA-specific things. Some of that we'll touch on as we go through this. Okay. So what is OpenCL? Uh, it's 
open computing language. So it is an open source language. Uh, it's an open environment. It uh, is, was originally created by Apple more than a decade ago, and then a consortium of different companies all got together, and Kronos Group was created to manage language. They're the same group that manages OpenGL. And so the OpenCL language is built up of a consortium of companies, including AMD, NVIDIA, um, at the time Altera, uh, and Intel, and a few other companies that you see on the slide, some, of, uh, some other FPGA vendors there as well. They're all together in a consortium to work on this language. The first spec was ratified just a little bit under 10 years ago at the end of 20, 2008. And uh, today, uh, the language is in a pretty stable state. There are new releases being released uh, here and there, but it's generally a pretty stable language by this point. And what it is is it's a, a low-level programming language based on ANSI C. There is both a API for the host as well as uh, the, the CL language, which is um, C code that is targeted at a kernel. We'll talk a little bit more about both those pieces in the next sections. And one of the really nice things is it gives you a single environment for heterogeneous platforms, like we said. You can target with OpenCL. Um, you can target a multi-core CPU. You can target GPUs. You can target FPGAs using the same language and same constructs. Okay. So the language provides us with a C99-based uh, language full of abstract models to abstract away our hardware underneath so that we can have a language uh, and a model that's generic and flexible and also portable, um, somewhat portable. It's not always that straightforward to port from one architecture to another. You do have to do things specific to the architecture, but somewhat portable uh, between architectures, at least more portable than it would have been if you didn't have this language. Okay. And some other properties is that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, parallelism is defined by the programmer, so you will specify what the parallelism is, both data parallelism and task parallelism will be explicitly uh, specified in your code. Uh, the loop pipeline, like the pipeline parallelism I was showing, that will be identified by the compiler, and the compiler will figure out, oh, gee, I, based on my data dependencies, I can pipeline some of these things. And so in the case of FPGA, uh, we will build up pipelined hardware based on what we see in your code. So that third piece there uh, is automated by the compiler. And at the same time, you do need to be aware of what memory is available to your code because uh, data storage and movement is explicitly defined. Uh, you'll, have, you'll be aware of specific memory buffers. And this is usually um, one of the bigger challenges as well, is just being aware of memory and where you're going to put things and how it moves. So that does need to be defined in terms of what the accelerator uh, function is doing with uh, memory. There's two sides of OpenCL. There's the kernel function itself, which is uh, the CL code, which you refer to it as CL code, that's going to actually run on your accelerator. So in the case of like a GPU, this would be code, C code that's gonna run on the GPU. And then there's also the host program. So this is your software that will run on a conventional microprocessor, like your Xeon CPU. And then the host code will interact with the kernel function uh, via a set of APIs. So in terms of memory model, OpenCL defines four different categories of memory. We have private memory, which is uh, specific to a single, uh, like a, a work item. So a work item within your kernel has, can have private memory. Then there is local memory, which is shared within something defined in the spec as a work group. And then you also have global memory uh, or constant memory, which is visible to all work groups. And then in addition to that, we have the host memory, which um, is visible to the host CPU. And that host memory could be shared with the device side of things as well. 
So to get into a simple example, consider a vector addition function. So here, I don't know how well you can read it, but there is a C function, a very simple vector add. We have a vector A and a vector B, and we will add the two vectors together, you know, element-wise to create an output C. And if we define the number of elements N, we might call that with a vector add function call there. Okay. And in a minute, we'll look at different ways we can implement this in OpenCL. So with OpenCL code, uh, we can parallelize our function that needs to happen by creating a corresponding kernel. Okay. And the kernel can provide data parallelism with uh, something called an ND range launch, okay. uh, N dimension range. So we have N dimension to our array and we have an ND range launch. And uh, we can really represent our parallelism at the finest granularity possible. 